Russia is using its oil and natural gas exports as a weapon against Europe. But could Russia be the one paying the price? Welcome to America Uncovered. I'm Chris Chappell. This episode is sponsored by Incogni. You probably know the companies are collecting your personal data, but you may not realize just how many. Dozens, maybe hundreds, most of which you've never heard of. And you have no idea what they're doing with it. Incogni helps you stop them. And I'll explain more at the end. So, Russia has proven to be a rather unreliable friend kind of friend who lets you use their extra cell phone on their family plan, but then cancels your service when they get mad at you. Also, they left a bunch of weird pics on it. That's exactly what Russia's doing with its friendship pipeline. And yes, its pipeline to Europe is actually named friendship in Russian. Because nothing says friendship like energy dependency. Okay, to be fair, the friendship name came from the Soviet Union, the friendliest tyrants. Russia uses its pipelines to sell its neighbors reliable energy, but then it also uses them as economic and political leverage when things don't go exactly the way it wants, like when its neighbors place sanctions on it. Russia's like that one kid on the block nobody likes, but everyone acts nice to because they have a pool. Maybe that's why Putin is shirtless all the time. He's just ready for a pool party. Last week, Natural gas prices soared in Europe after Russia sanctioned several energy companies that supply gas to Europe. This could mean less gas to Europe. And Germany's economic affairs minister said Russia's sanctions could drive up fuel prices in Europe. If that's what Russia is doing, it makes sense. Russia needs money to fund the war in Ukraine, and if it can drive up prices, it can get more money without selling more product. And the best part is, it can get back at Europe for its sanctions against Russia. And that's what's been happening already. According to one report, Russia was able to double its revenue from oil, gas, and coal in the first two months of its Ukraine invasion simply due to price increases. And people still paid for it. Russian fuel is like Nike shoes. You know it's overpriced and unethical, but it's what everyone else runs on and you don't want to feel left out. Russia has a history of restricting oil and gas exports to Europe, but it's always for perfectly legitimate reasons, totally not political. Like in 2010, when Russia cut off gas to Belarus supposedly for not paying its bills. But at the time, the Kremlin was unhappy with Belarus's president, Alexander Lukashenko, for not joining a customs union with Russia and Kazakhstan. And one think tank analyst said Russia's gas cutoff was at least partly for that reason. Lukashenko was facing an election, and high energy prices would have hurt his campaign. So Russia had him in a bind. If citizens were mad at Lukashenko, then he would have only won the election with 111% of the vote instead of 130% of the vote. But that wasn't the only time Russia's pipelines were a political problem. In 2006, Georgia accused Russia of orchestrating several pipeline explosions that stopped gas flow in the middle of winter. Georgia claimed Russia was trying to punish them for seeking political and energy independence from Russia. And there have been numerous disputes between Ukraine and Russia over the years, where Russia stopped energy exports to Ukraine for reasons having absolutely nothing to do with politics whatsoever. None. Most recently, a Russian energy supplier cut power to Finland the day before it was set to officially announce its plan to join NATO. The company said it was over a payment issue. Right. Funny how there's always a billing error right when Russia's mad at you. So Russia has a history of turning off the energy spigot at, shall we say, convenient times. And the U.S. has even gotten involved once or twice. How? I'll tell you after the break. Welcome back. Knowing Russia's long history of using natural gas as a political and economic weapon, the U.S. has been concerned about its NATO allies in Europe. It's been concerned since before some of the pipelines were even built. But a 1981 CIA intelligence assessment of a proposed 3,000-mile-long natural gas pipeline from Siberia to Western Europe warned of trouble ahead. 
It said the pipeline would be a reliable source of gas for the continent, but it would also give the Soviets political leverage over Europe. That was talking about the Soviet Union rather than Russia, but <laughs> potato, potato. Under President Trump, the U.S. threatened to sanction companies building a pipeline from Russia to Germany. In the 2010s, the 760-mile-long Nord Stream pipeline connecting Russia with Germany via the Baltic Sea began operations. A decade later, the Turk Stream natural gas pipeline connecting Russia's largest gas reserves with southern Europe via Turkey kicked off. Construction was completed in 2021 on the Nord Stream 2, a companion pipeline designed to double the flow of Russian gas directly to Germany. But with the Ukrainian crisis deepening, Germany froze its participation in the $11 billion project. Wow. This is the largest pipe system I've seen worked on by a European since that Italian one. Although that was more for personal transport. It was this Nord Stream 2 pipeline the U.S. wanted to stop. The U.S. wasn't opposed to Germany getting some energy from Russia. After all, the U.S. also imports Russian oil. But the Trump administration thought it was a bad idea for Germany to be so reliant on Russia. Even without Nord Stream 2, Germany relied on Russia for about a third of its oil and more than half its gas. Relying so heavily on Russia is the worst decision Germany has ever made. Well, maybe the third worst decision. So Russia already had a lot of leverage over Germany, and the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was just going to make matters worse. Which is why President Trump swooped in to save the day. We're protecting Germany from Russia, right? NATO. We're protecting Germany from Russia. Germany's paying Russia billions and billions of dollars to get their energy. And the real number is probably 60 to 70 percent ultimately of their energy is going to come from Russia. And I said, why is Germany making a deal to give billions of dollars to Russia and then we're protecting Germany from Russia? How does that work? Yes. Only Trump saw the problems with Nord Stream 2, according to Trump. Let's just say Germany wasn't thrilled with the U.S. threatening to sanction the German companies building the pipeline. And although President Biden also said he was against the pipeline, he waived the sanctions on the German company operating the pipeline. Although the Biden administration continued to sanction Russian companies that were involved. And Biden finally sanctioned the German company the day before Russia invaded Ukraine. And after the war started, Germany essentially canceled it. But it shouldn't have taken a war, people. Putin has been in power since 1999. But Chris, you say he was a kinder, gentler Putin back then. He even talked about Russia joining NATO. Well, if you believe that, I got a pipeline of Russia to sell you. The point is, Europe essentially invited Russian interference the moment they said yes to all those pipelines. So now, Russia knows it has Europe between a rock and a hard place, and it's using that to its advantage. Europe as a whole relies on Russia for about 40% of its natural gas, and about 25% of its oil. So when Putin declared in March that unfriendly countries needed to pay for their gas in rubles, the EU tried to push back, telling companies not to comply. After all, rubles are more volatile than Bitcoin. But some companies did it anyway. Or kind of. You see, what Russia wanted was for companies to open two accounts with Gazprom Bank, one of the few Russian banks that hasn't been hit with Western sanctions. Companies could put dollars or euros or whatnot into one of the accounts. The bank would then convert the money into rubles and put it in the other account. Which is exactly what the companies did. So Putin kind of got his cake and ate it too. Which is surprising since he knows that's going to go straight to his hips. Companies were still able to pay in dollars and euros, but Putin could claim they're paying in rubles, which looked like a big win for Russia. It also helped prop up the ruble, which lost a lot of value after the start of the war. For companies that didn't go along with this scheme, Russia made good on its promise to cut supplies. Last month, Gazprom Bank halted gas exports to Poland and Bulgaria for failure to pay in rubles. The EU called it blackmail for its sanctions on Russia. Gazprom's announcement that it is unilaterally stopping gas deliveries to certain EU member states is another provocation from the Kremlin. But it comes as no surprise that the Kremlin uses fossil fuels to try to blackmail us. Although, to be fair, blackmail is probably the nicest crime Russia is known for. At least this one doesn't leave stains or scorch marks. 
Poland's deputy foreign minister said the country could cope without Russia's gas because it had taken some decisions many years ago to prepare for such a situation. Bulgaria said the same thing. So far, neither country is planning to bow to Russian pressure. What happens next could set a pretty important precedent for Europe's fight with Russia. How? I'll tell you more after the break. Welcome back. Russia has been using its oil and natural gas exports to put pressure on Europe, and Europe is not happy about it. Almost all EU member states want to get off Russian energy. The question is, can they? Quitting Russian oil cold turkey will be hard, and redundant since all turkeys in Russia are cold. At a meeting of G7 leaders earlier this month, countries vowed to phase out their dependency on Russian energy, including by phasing out or banning the import of Russian oil. The timeline for each is going to be different, but this could scar Russia's economy for years to come. Although, to be fair, Russia's economy already has more scars than all the people they poisoned. The EU has a plan to phase out Russian oil by the end of the year. Easier than natural gas, because the EU isn't so reliant on it. But the problem is Hungary. Hungary has said stopping Russian oil now would be like a nuclear bomb for its economy. To which Putin replied, oh, I have those too. Hungary's refineries are geared toward Russian crude, and stopping Russian oil now, it says, would cause prices to rise more than 50%. Hungary says it gets 65% of its oil from Russia. It estimates it will cost about 700 million euros and take four years to convert its infrastructure. It's now asking the EU to help with the cost and says it won't cooperate if the EU doesn't. Slovakia and the Czech Republic also say they can't transition by the end of the year. Brussels has offered them an extension through 2024, but talks are ongoing. This plan to phase out Russian oil was part of a larger sanctions package on Russia. The package is being stalled because it requires every EU state to agree with it. This is exactly the kind of havoc Russia loves. The more it can divide Europe, the weaker Europe will be. But is Russia shooting itself in the foot? Oil and natural gas made up almost half of Russia's federal budget last year. And with Russia's economy facing a major contraction, losing revenue from either industry would be bad. Major oil traders are cutting their Russian oil purchases. Wow, I'm surprised committing human rights abuses would make people not want to do business with you. I'm not being sarcastic, I'm actually surprised considering how many countries are still doing business with China. But that drop in demand has been offset by higher prices, which is why some are predicting that Russia could see its revenue increase by more than a third compared to last year. This is good news for Russia because it relies on oil and natural gas to pay for its military. And without the swift victory Putin hoped for in Ukraine, Russia is going to need a lot more revenue to sustain its invasion. The US and UK have already banned Russian energy. But even before the ban, the U.S. wasn't importing any Russian natural gas and only got about 8% of its oil imports from Russia. The real challenge is going to be getting Europe off Russian energy. Maybe we can do an intervention. As a bloc, the EU was the destination for almost half of Russia's crude oil exports. And it imported about three quarters of Russia's natural gas. Which is why Russia is in a delicate balancing act when threatening to cut energy supplies to Europe over its sanctions. Just like Europe is trying to diversify its energy imports, Russia is trying to diversify its exports. Putin had ordered the government to forge closer energy ties with Asia and diversify energy supplies away from Europe. Who ends up winning this game of chicken could be decided by who can transition the fastest. And if Russia can't find new markets for its energy, it could also significantly shift the global balance of power. This episode has been sponsored by Incogni. Whenever you do anything online, there's a huge number of companies that collect your personal data. Your name, your email, your home address, your social security number, your employment history, all sorts of things. And what are they doing with your data? They're buying it, selling it, and trading it like you're a piece of meat. And it's hard to cut off this pipeline just because you don't like them. Worse. The companies that are holding on to your personal information could get hacked. You've got hackers from Russia, but that's not all you need to worry about. Hackers all over the world are trying to steal people's personal data. For example, in 2021, hackers got into LinkedIn and put the private data of 700 million users up for sale on the dark web. That included users' names, phone numbers, and profile data. And if LinkedIn can be hacked, so can all the smaller companies that buy and sell your data. That's why I signed up for Incogni. 
and I discovered there were 76 data brokers that potentially had my private information. I had never heard of most of these companies, but they had definitely heard of me. Incogni forces these companies to delete your data. There are laws that allow you to do this, but if you want to do it yourself, you'd have to figure out the applicable laws, write letters in a specific legal way, and follow up to make sure your instructions are followed. Incogni handles this for you. Three months after signing up, Incogni had already gotten my details removed from 19 of these data brokers, with 35 more in progress, and I didn't have to do anything after signing up. So check out Incogni using the link below, or go to incogni.com uncovered. The first 100 people to use the code uncovered will get 20% off. Get your personal data off the market with Incogni. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching America Uncovered.